It's an honor to be here and to be part of this incredibly important conference. I'm going to be talking about addressing psychological trauma in addiction treatment. And there has been a lot of very exciting work in this area over the past several decades. I'll be talking about some of the key points and highlighting how, when addressing psychological trauma in the context of addiction treatment, it gives an inroad to be able to better engage patients in the work. So first, the importance of trauma. Trauma is a global problem. It exists all over the world. It's the experience, threat, or witnessing of death, serious injury, or sexual violence. We want to separate it from just stressors, which are difficult events, but which are not technically traumas. So stressors might be job loss, might be poverty, might be divorce. Those are difficult events, but traumas are at a completely different level. They really are life-changing events for these individuals. And when we think of the nature of traumas, it exists in so many different forms, war, famine, natural disaster like hurricanes and tornadoes, domestic violence, child physical and sexual abuse, motor vehicle accidents, fires, industrial accidents, torture, and many other types of traumatic events. And in many countries, uh, the majority of people experience trauma. We also know that trauma is associated with mental and physical illnesses of all kinds, of which substance use disorder is one of the main ones. Um, and so as we talk about it, we're really going to come at it from the perspective of this being a public health problem. Listening to the patients who have experienced trauma, you'll hear many different connections to addiction. I was drinking to keep from killing myself. I drank to stay with my abuser, to get the booze, the alcohol into me, so when he hit me, I wouldn't feel it. Heroin is the only way I know to nurture myself. And what many patients will say is that even though they know that there are long-term consequences of substance use, in the short term, it does help people manage feelings, helps them to sleep, helps them to be able to tolerate trauma and abuse. The DSM-5 definition of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, um, goes to some of the core types of symptoms that arise from trauma. So trauma is epidemic, but a minority of people will go on to actually have full-blown PTSD. There's also the ICD definition of PTSD, which is slightly different, but also highly overlapping. So as we said, trauma is the experience, threat, or witnessing of death, serious injury, or sexual violence. And in the context of PTSD, four clusters of symptoms, intrusion, basically re-experiencing the event over and over in one's mind, nightmares, flashbacks, which are like little almost movie clips of the event, unwanted intrusions, avoidance, they can't talk about it. It's too distressing. Negative thoughts and mood, depressed, feeling hopeless, and so on. Arousal and reactivity, intensely triggered when reminded of the event, intense reactions, as well as sleep problems, anger outbursts, endures more than a month, causes functional problems. The person isn't the same in their work life, in their social life, and not due to substance use, medication, or other illness. And listening to clients about why they're using substances in the context of trauma, one hears many, many different reasons. To access feelings or memories, the person may say they feel dead inside, numb, and using just helps them to feel alive, to feel something. Or the opposite, overwhelmed with too much feeling. So using substances to shut off feelings or memories, to try to get through the day. 
And when you think about it, these first two are the two opposite extremes of the PTSD experience. No feeling or too much feeling. And substances become a way to regulate feelings in the short term. Learned behavior. A client may say, this is how I learned to cope growing up. People in my family were addicted. There was a lot of trauma going on. And we do know that family history is one of the biggest predictors of both PTSD and substance abuse due to both genetic and social influences. Slow suicide, wanting to die, not caring if they overdose. And very clearly across a very wide range of literature, those with both disorders, PTSD and substance abuse, improve less have worse coping, more distress, and more positive use of substances than those with substance abuse alone. So sometimes called double trouble or double jeopardy. It really is harder for these clients to get better. Now, as you may know, um, in the addiction field, the message to clients and to the workforce for most of the 20th century and still existing today is the message that they should first get clean and sober, first deal with the addiction, and then and only then deal with the PTSD and the trauma. But if there's one major take home message from the literature in this area and consistent across over 35 studies, it's that actually addressing both at the same time and from the start of treatment um, shows positive outcomes and does not show worsening. So there's been a complete um, turnaround in how we look at addressing trauma in the context of substance abuse. Another major and important development is the concept of trauma-informed care, which is the idea that all staff across all settings um, should be trained to identify trauma and PTSD. So certainly that includes clinicians, counselors, and therapists, but also administrators, secretaries, security staff, nursing staff. Everyone in the setting should learn what trauma is because it shows up so often in these clients' behavior in so many ways. And it becomes a lens by which to better understand and more effectively work with these clients. So some of the very difficult behaviors one sees uh, clinically, if addressed through the lens of trauma, becomes much more manageable. Clients with anger outbursts, clients who get into power struggles, clients who come across as entitled, um, all sorts of clinical issues when viewed through empathy and compassion related to trauma um, allow a much more effective set of interventions. Routine assessment for trauma and PTSD um, is now recommended because of the high rates of these and the connection to other issues. And distinguishing trauma-informed services, basic trauma education for all staff to become aware of trauma versus trauma-specific services, uh, which are specific trauma models to try to heal the PTSD. So some staff will become trauma-competent. I'll mention just a few resources. Um, one is the recent treatment improvement protocol from the SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, called TIP57, Trauma-Informed Care in Behavioral Health Settings. It's a free download uh, and provides very clinically relevant materials, including screening tools. The National Center for Trauma-Informed Care, which is one of SAMHSA's um, areas, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which deals with trauma in families, children, and adolescents. And the National Center for PTSD, which deals with trauma in the context of military and veterans. And just to highlight that trauma has impact not only on mental disorders, but also on physical health. And a landmark study known as the ACE study um, standing for Adverse Childhood Experiences, on over 17,000 pa medical patients in California looked at childhood-based traumatic events um, and also the context of household members with substance abuse, criminal involvement, um, and mental health issues. And very clearly showing that the more of these adverse childhood events, 
the more the adult health risk factors throughout the lifespan, including obesity, smoking, certainly substance abuse, sexually transmitted diseases, suicide attempts, and depression. And to highlight as well the impact of culture, um, that trauma can get carried across generations. And so trying to intervene as early as possible is always recommended. Historical trauma, that there are populations who have lived the legacy of trauma going back over centuries and decades. So adapting treatments to be respectful of culture, making use of local healing traditions, using language and examples relevant to culture, and exploring meanings of trauma and addiction within cultural contexts. So moving on to treatment, um, what's called the consensus model of PTSD treatment, the idea that one takes a phase-based approach. And one of the most beautiful and eloquent descriptions of this phase-based approach um, is from Judith Herman's classic book called Trauma and Recovery, published in 1992. The first stage is safety, basically stabilizing the client giving them education about trauma and associated conditions, helping teach them coping skills, helping them teach how trauma shows up in their lives in so many different ways, and basically giving them a foundation. The second phase is called mourning, um, basically grief work to explore the trauma events, to feel the feelings connected to the memories of it, basically to tell the trauma story and finally, reconnection, to move into the future, healthy work life, social life, and so on. So I like to think of it in terms of um, time element as well. Safety is present focused. Mourning or grief work is past focused. And reconnection is future focused. So how is trauma and PTSD typically addressed? Um, in many settings, it's still a major public health issue that it is not addressed at all. Um, it was late moving into the diagnostic uh, uh, nomenclature, and so it still is the case that many frontline providers are not trained to treat trauma or PTSD. When it is addressed, there are two basic ways to go about it. Most people, and this is clinicians and clients, go immediately to that line on the bottom. Focus on the past. These events happened in the past, so let's get the client to talk about it, to process it, to work it through. And that is state-of-the-art evidence-based treatment for PTSD, going by many different names, <coughs> exposure therapy, prolonged exposure therapy, narrative exposure therapy, EMDR, which stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy, many, many other sort of brand names of therapies. But in essence, each one, in some form or another, gets the client to tell the story of what happened and to work through the feelings. And that can be excellent work, except that in the context of addiction, it may be too emotionally intense to move them into those strong feelings. So focusing on the present is the other way to go about it. Focusing just on current symptoms, education, and coping skills. And we'll talk a little bit about seeking safety, which is a present focus model that was specifically designed for co-occurring trauma problems or PTSD and substance abuse that stays only in the present. And I'll just mention that as the author of Seeking Safety, I have um, conflict of interest, um, but I'll also cover a little bit about the broader literature. So there are various different treatments that have been um, developed and or tested for this comorbidity of PTSD and substance use disorder. Seeking safety, um, by far the most studied, with 24 studies. Um, other models I'll just name for now, trauma recovery and empowerment model, integrated CBT for PTSD and substance use disorder, women's integrated treatment, which is a gender-focused approach, concurrent treatment of PTSD and cocaine dependence, um, uh, later called concurrent prolonged exposure, substance dependence PTSD therapy, prolonged exposure revised, later called creating change, and trauma adaptive recovery group education and therapy. And then ex prolonged exposure, which has been um, studied in four studies, 
um, in a PTSD substance abuse population, even though the model wasn't specifically designed for it. I'll mention briefly that there's a, there are various literature reviews out there, um, and some of this material is drawn from a, a review I did with Denise Hien in 2013. Some of the key findings from this literature, positive outcomes across this literature. However, it appears to be easier to change the PTSD than the substance use disorder. So what you see is um, in many of these studies, there's improvement, significant improvement in PTSD, but not necessarily in substance use disorder. And so far, only seeking safety and TREM, trauma recovery and empowerment model, outperformed a control condition on substance use disorder, and only seeking safety outperformed a control on both PTSD and substance use disorder. Um, that being said, it's a very early literature. There still is a need for much more. And from a public health standpoint, we really need to look beyond models, um, appeal of different treatments. What can the clients and clinicians get on board with? Ease of implementation, cost, dropout rates, workforce requirements, especially in publicly funded systems of care where you often have providers um, who themselves have various issues. Sometimes the most intense clients get some of the least trained providers. So attending to workforce as well, many of these people have their own history of trauma or addiction themselves. Large caseloads of complex clients, often without sufficient support, and certainly more research needed on how best to select and retain these clinicians. So as we think about treatment, um, taking into account that full spectrum of issues. Exposure therapy for PTSD and substance use disorder. I'll just highlight that briefly because that is one of the most um, studied other than seeking safety. Um, and there are positive results for it. Again, this is a past focused approach. Um, and basically comparing it to less intensive models, um, meaning emotionally less intensive um, or present focused, supportive counseling or treatment as usual, found that both types of treatments, um, clients improved, but exposure therapy so far at least did not outperform the less intensive model on either PTSD or substance use disorder by the end of treatment. Again, it's an early literature, more is needed, but the main point is um, greater emotional intensity does not necessarily equal better outcomes. And so in the context of substance use, uh, thinking broadly about what will help retain clients and achieve positive results. So seeking safety, briefly, is a model um, designed for the comorbidity in particular, going back to the 1990s, which focuses on coping skills in the present. And it offers 25 different topics, meaning um, different themes, each one of which relates both to substance abuse and to trauma. Um, however, it can be done in much shorter um, settings. So for example, uh, in a detox setting, there might be time for only a few topics or um, in a uh, outpatient setting, maybe just time for six or 12 sessions. So whatever time allows for. I'll just mention briefly the website seekingsafety.org has a lot more information on the model and a lot of freely downloadable materials. So seeking safety, typically done as treatment, but can be done as training, a sort of classroom style approach for families of traumatized people in the military where people may not want to admit that they have problems with trauma, um, in schools where students may not want to admit that they have problems designed for flexibility. So it can vary in length, as we said, also in format. It can be run as group um, treatment, which is the primary way it tends to get run because of the cost savings in doing it that way, but it can be run as individual. An easy model to do, it can be done by anyone. It does not require any formal training um, in, at all in terms of the model itself. People just pick up the book and use it. Um, and it can be done by any provider. They don't have to have any particular degree, credentials. It's been used by what are called advocates in all kinds of settings. It's been used by peers um, and others. And to my knowledge, it's the lowest cost PTSD model available because of those factors. Translated at this point into 12 languages um, and has shown positive outcomes in international pilots as well as um, US studies. 
as we said, can be done by anyone, used for over 20 years, for any type of trauma, any type of substance use disorder, designed for both genders, group or individual format, open or closed groups, and has been implemented a lot with highly vulnerable populations, meaning people who tend to have a lot of other issues, even in addition to the PTSD and substance use disorder. So things like homelessness, criminal justice involvement, mild traumatic brain injury, and other cognitive impairments. Um, so the wide variety of things that these clients are walking in the door with. I'll just give a few examples of some of the 25 Seeking Safety topics. Asking for help. Detaching from emotional pain called grounding, basically a way to bring down any intense distress, including substance craving. Healthy relationships, taking good care of yourself, coping with triggers, and we're talking about both trauma and addiction triggers. Creating meaning, identifying some of the core beliefs that go along with this comorbidity. Setting boundaries in relationships, compassion, healing from anger, basically uh, cognitive, behavioral, interpersonal themes, and also a heavy dose of case management, trying to engage these clients in as much other treatment as possible, both medical and mental um, health and substance abuse treatments. And I'll just close with identifying um, one example of one of the studies. This is by my colleague Denise Hien, um, published in 2015. A randomized controlled trial, outpatient, 12 sessions. So this is a good example of a partial dose study using only 12 of the 25 sessions or themes. Individual format, um, combining seeking safety plus sertraline, an antidepressant in one condition versus seeking safety plus medication placebo in the other condition. A sample size of 69, primarily African-American, primarily childhood trauma. Both conditions showed significant improvements in both PTSD and alcohol use disorder at the end of treatment with large effect sizes, with gains sustained at both six and 12 month follow-ups with medium effect sizes at those follow-up points. The Seeking Safety Plus sertraline condition had greater reduction than the Seeking Safety Plus placebo on PTSD, but not on alcohol use disorder. Um, so just the Seeking Safety alone um, improved both conditions as well, um, but the improvement in PTSD was slightly stronger in the sertraline condition and no difference for early versus late onset of alcohol use disorder. So I'll close here. Thank you.